I'll try and cover for you and take on from where Ronaldo left you in terms of the next step for maintaining CRT. Uh, those are just my disclosures for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to go through three broad questions. Why, uh, what, and how? And I think that uh, hopefully I'll cover each of them. So the first aspect into the why, uh, if you do not have a circuit which is performing, it influences almost every aspect of CRT. Most importantly, dose delivery, labor, and that's the labor from the nursing staff or from anybody else involved in CRT, and therefore adds to the resource utilization costs overall. And that's evidenced by just some studies. So this is the best study, which is the best kidney study, which was done many years ago, again demonstrating that to a large extent the median filter life was really low, and the filter downtime was pretty high. So as a consequence, when you looked at the downtime of the filters, whatever the reasons they were, they had contributed to a significant reduction in therapy so that over time you were performing very little CRT, if at all, any continuous therapy at all. And that's evidenced again by some other studies demonstrating here is that if you look at a prescribed dose versus what is actually delivered and the time of day it is delivered, it's about 30% of the times you're not delivering anything. So that's, that's a major reason, therefore, to look at it. And when we looked at this in multiple other studies, whether it's an intermittent dialysis or CRT, that reflects both in terms of a reduction in terms of the delivered dose uh, across the board. One of the things that we've been looking at is essentially in our, in our center, we measure the efficacy of the filter every 12 hours, simply by looking at the fluid urea nitrogen and the blood urea nitrogen ratio. And if that ratio drops to 0.8 or lower, we change the filter, even though it's clotted or not. And if you apply that principle, what you see here is here's the prescribed amount by, say, ml per kilo or whatever effluent volume you want it to be. This is what you estimate that clearance to be based upon the time that the person's on. This is actually what you do deliver if you measure it. So there is a reduction over time. And what you see here is, so this is just a, re uh, a reflection of the filters in our institution here. And you can see here's the number of filters. The vast majority of them are being changed for a variety of different things. They're not being changed for clotting. They're being changed, patient went down for CT scan or they're changed for someone had to go for surgery, other aspects here. Of the ones which are clotted, but a significant number of them have this reduction of this fun one ratio. And what's important to notice is that the filters which clot have the same fun bond ratio as the filters which don't clot. So what that means is that essentially what is happening is that over time, the filter is getting a membrane of protein layering on top of it. And that protein layering phenomena is called concentration repolarization. So as you can anticipate is as you're pushing blood across the filter, you are also applying pressure and so proteins are getting stuck. And the more ultrafiltration you do, the higher the blood flow rate, the more likely you are to start clogging the pores of the filter over time, independent of the anticoagulant that you would utilize in that setting. And that's evidenced by this. So if you look at fi our filters which are functioning, this is the normal filter function, and this is a compromised filter, you can see that over time, this is every 12-hour filter period, over time the compromised filters will start deteriorating. But even the ones which are normal functioning with the efficacy being parameters will start reducing efficacy over time independent of the anticoagulation efficacy. So therefore, it becomes important for us to recognize both these factors occurring, both in terms of the blood membrane interaction from the coagulation cascade, but also the blood membrane interaction independent of the coagulation cascade, which is happening in that part. And I can see that this ends up therefore being the filter efficacy and the impact of downtime, you can see multiple studies have demonstrated the same aspect overall. So to just summarize that first part of why, you can see you, these would be the goals overall. It's obviously to prevent clotting and maintain the efficacy, avoid systemic anticoagulation at the same time, and then also provide an inert surface for the blood membrane interaction to occur. If those are the goals, then what do we have? as opportunities to make, achieve those goals in the anticoagulation cascade. So this is simply a reflection of the PrismaFlex circuit. That's because that's the device we've been using now for many years. And you can see here is you've got the, the blood going in and you've got the return overall. 
But what's more important to know is, so just simply, these are the membranes for the Prismaflex available. And what you see here is the blood volume and the capacity. So you can see that the circuit size varies depending upon what membrane you're using, what machine you're using. So I think the first aspect of this is to familiarize ourselves is how big is the membrane, how big is the circuit, because that's going to influence your anticoagulant strategy. It's going to influence how you actually address this overall. So by the time you get this, it's too late. So basically, what you want to do is to avoid getting to this phase here, and the factors you think about are these three the vascular axis, the circuit factors, and then insufficient anticoagulation. So Ronaldo covered for you very nicely the current strategies for axis itself. But in general, when we look at this with respect to the, the efficacy for anticoagulation or maintaining the circuit, you've got these choices here, so 12 to 16 French, the choice of the insertion site, the femoral and right juggler, as he suggested to you, the positioning, and Overall, how do you actually maintain it? So even though Ronaldo suggested that you don't need catheter lock solutions, you actually do, even for the time frames that you've taken the patient off for the therapy for a few hours. You do need to catheter lock it. And therefore, the handling of the catheter and how you set it up becomes very crucial. You can't leave the catheter without any catheter lock solution, even for a few hours. That becomes an important aspect there. And therefore, flushing the catheter in terms of dysfunction, how you go about this, again, needs to be standardized itself. What we do in our institution is actually start the catheter with a two stopcocks. And the reason for this is very simple, is almost all the manufacturers have the access to the anticoagulant some distance away from the connection site for the catheter. As a consequence, when you put the anticoagulant at that, that designated site, you're leaving a portion, even if it's a few inches, of the catheter, which is non-anticoagulated. So we've always done this as such, and by simply doing this, you have also two opportunities. Because here, you can also block this and just put saline as a flush through if you needed to flush the line or the flush the system. It also gives you an opportunity in terms of taking your blood samples at different points in time itself. So that's just something we do. But one of the more important aspects is understanding the role of filtration fraction. And this is very simply evidenced by a simple concept here. As you take a hematocrit of 25 here at the start of blood entering the filter, as you go across the filter, as you're removing 17 mLs, let's assume you're taking that much ultrafiltration, which is one liter an hour. So if you have a blood flow rate of 100 mLs per minute, you have a, a hematocrit of 25, that means you've got 75 mLs of plasma. The 75 mLs of plasma is going to have 17 mLs of plasma taken out. You will therefore concentrate the blood emerging from this side by that same proportion. So this ratio of the 17 mLs to the 75 mLs is the filtration fraction. And if you can visualize this, you can see depending upon where you put the blood and how you put it, if you dilute the blood going in, you reduce this filtration fraction because the more viscous the blood is as it emerges from the filter, the more likely it is that it will clot. Therefore, it becomes very important to recognize that this filtration fraction aspect of more than 20 to 25 percent is correlated with frequent clotting itself. And therefore, your attempt should be to try and keep that overall. And what that does is, so for example, if you have an ultrafiltration rate of 1,000 mL an hour, versus 2,000 mLs per hour, and these were just your hematocrits here, you can see if your blood flow rate is 150 versus 200, the more ultrafiltration you have, the higher your blood flow rate needs to be to maintain that filtration fraction. And this becomes absolutely essential if you're using CVVH, because in CVVH, the only way for you to get any clearance across is by increasing the ultrafiltration rate. So every time you make an adjustment on this, it therefore makes a big difference. And therefore, it also starts bringing into context that your vascular access has to be able to deliver the blood flow, otherwise you will never be able to get past that filtration fraction component itself. The other aspect in the circuit here, at least in the Prismaflex, and I believe this is the same in all, almost all the machines, is there is a deaeration chamber. And this is where you have a blood-air interface. So the blood air interface is where the blood is really steadily stagnant, and this is designed so that you do not get air embolism, because so you can decompress it. 
So in order to keep this part open, you need to always constantly infuse fluid post-filter to maintain this aeration chamber open. So therefore, that becomes another additional aspect to just make sure that you are addressing itself. Now onwards to the coagulation cascade. So this is, uh, this is just a cartoon demonstrating both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways for coagulation. And you can see that all of these are coming in, into play to a large extent. But what we have, therefore, to address is what are the techniques that we can apply to this. So the first one is the mechanical aspect. And I've already talked to you a little bit about reducing the viscosity with them of the pre-dilution, making sure that your air-blood interface isn't the area where you start the clotting itself. And then when you get into the other aspects, I'm going to spend some more time now just discussing these here. So when you look at unfractionated heparin, unfractionated heparin is acting through antithrombin-3. And it's acting through all these, these pathways here, predominantly in the intrinsic, intrinsic system. And as a consequence, it's got a half-life of about two to four hours, but it is affected by antithrombin-3 deficiency. And I'll tell you why that happens in just a minute overall. In contrast, low molecular heparin has a much more specific action on 10A. So therefore, antifactor 10A becomes its component overall, and it has a half-life of about 10 hours in contrast to the unfractionated heparin of about two to four hours. When you look at citrate, citrate works by chelating calcium. Now, calcium is at every step, whether it's the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway. So by chelating the calcium, you are therefore preventing the clotting cascade to occur by itself. And as a consequence of this, you can measure the anticoagulant effect by looking at the ionized calcium in the post-filter and replacing the calcium in the systemic. And I'm going to go into more details about the, th about the way this is done in just a minute. Another set of, of agents is thrombin inhibitors. Now, thrombin is sort of the end pathway of coagulation cascade, and you can see this is antagonized also by natural anticoagulants, which is protein C and thrombomodulin and activated protein C and protein S. So the fact that there's a balance in our coagulation system and we don't clot all the time is because these natural anticoagulants are always in position itself. But you could use a thrombin inhibitor to inhibit this, the coagulation cascade downstream, and some of those are activated protein C, you've got TFPI, but you've got fondiperonix and adriperonix are overall, and then you've also got hiridin, bivaleridin, argyrotroban, and zimelagetran as agents overall. So when you look at this in context here, what you see is unfractionated heparin is sort of in the center here. As you go down on terms of more the anti-10A pathway, you've got low molecular heparin, heparinoids, and then fondiperonix, and then you've got the thrombin inhibitors down on this end of things, whereas citrate is across the board. So word about anti, the natural anticoagulant pathways itself here is, you can see protein C, activated protein C and protein S are the physiological anticoagulants which are present. But what is important to recognize is that there are acquired deficiencies of natural anticoagulants, particularly in, in, in patients who have nephrotic syndrome or have protein-losing enteropathies because these anticoagulants get, get, get taken out of the system itself. And you can see here in then all these conditions, you have these deficiencies, and it matters because this is an old study done many years ago. When we look at those patients who have an antithrombin-3 deficiency versus controls, you can see that the levels are much lower in terms of the functional activity, but what happens is that they had their membrane duration is much small, shorter, and they have a much higher mortality. Now, we don't necessarily measure these contexts now, but just being aware of the fact that you can have these natural anticoagulant deficiencies is a huge factor in terms of understanding when heparin may not work, because heparin needs the substrate for antithrombin-3 to be able to work in that situation as such. So when you look at prostacycline, this is by inhibiting platelet aggregation, and it's a vasodilator. The downside of prostacycline is obviously systemic hypotension, which can occur in this setting itself. So now that I've shown you the techniques, I mean, what's available and why you need to do it, let's go into how do you do it itself. So when you look at no anticoagulation, this is sort of the preferred mode that most people tend to use because they've got bleeding disorders, you've got low platelet counts, and let's, let's just start with no anticoagulation. It's probably the worst way to do it. 
Because if you never measure your efficacy of your filter, you only wait till it clots. Now it clots in 16 hours, which means it stopped working about eight hours previously. So you're basically giving them an intermittent dialysis, calling it continuous, and making it seem that you're doing continuous therapy. I would recommend that you really visualize this aspect of things. If you're going to do no anticoagulation, then follow at least some basic principles of doing the pre-dilution, watching the filtration fraction, and also measuring the efficacy so that you are much more clearer in terms of what is happening here. Because the median life here is only about 16 hours itself. Now for un unfractionated heparin protocols, by the way, I'm, I'm indebted to Dr. Sheeta Tulwani for letting me use some of her slides for this so that she had already drawn some of these circuits very elegantly. Most of the time you go to prime with saline. Now one thing here is that if you use the syringe pump on the machine to deliver the heparin, you are using a very concentrated heparin solution. And therefore it doesn't mix very well with the blood flow. So it is much better to take heparin, say 20,000 units or 10,000 units, dilute it in a liter or two liters of saline, and use that as a much more dilute solution than the syringe pump, because it mixes better, and you can easily take care of the volume part by adjusting how much volume you're gonna take off. That's a much easier way to make sure that that, that happens there. But here, you're monitoring it by, by the circuit uh, activated pr uh, prothrombin time or a activated clotting time, depending upon what you have available, and you're trying to maintain this. Again, in most of these, it's only about 20 hours to 24 hours of patency, which occurs in these, in these patients here. Now, one thing here, obviously, for heparin dosing is that you have to identify the risk. So this is, for example, if you look at a lower risk patient whose platelet counts are normal, they don't have as much of a bleeding tendency, you have the opportunity to give a little higher loading dose and therefore can adjust the dose every time as you go along, and the target PTT is here. Whereas as you go on to higher risk patients, that becomes problematic, and that to some extent is determined also by what your platelet counts are. Because as you go down this pathway, in terms of your platelet counts being much higher, you can see that this filter lifetime doesn't change much, but your bleeding risk magnifies considerably as you go into the higher risk population as such. The advantages of this are it's obviously easy, it's easily available, it's relatively inexpensive, you don't have to have much aspect of it, but you do also have this risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in addition to the bleeding risk that comes up, and so therefore you need to be monitoring for that aspect itself. When you lose ultra unfractioned heparin, you can reverse the effect of protamine. The trouble is this becomes much more complex because the protamine to heparin neutralization ratio varies in different patients, and also you have protamine sensitivity. So to a large extent, most people do not use protamine, this regional anticoagulation methodology in these patients uh, any longer. When you look at, and so there's, again, this hypersensitivity and hypotension are much more of a problem. Now, there are some heparin-coated membranes which are out there. I am not familiar with them. They're not available in the United States, and I don't think that too much, evident, too much data has been generated on this. This is the auxiliary membrane, but I, I know Patrick Honore is at the meeting, so if you choose, you might want to ask him if they have had uh, experience with this. Now, low molecular weight heparin protocols, you've got an oxaparin, an adroparin, and daltaparin as such, and you can see the loading doses here. To a large extent, these are effective. The problem is that you have to monitor it with anti-factor 10A, and that activity is not easily available. That assay takes a little longer, so you may not have that opportunity. And plus, you don't have as much uh, flexibility with respect to reversing this as you go along. What about the heridin molecules itself? So this is reversible inhibitors. They are continuous infusions. The targets are here. And the trouble is there's no antidote. So you just have to wait for it to sort of get past that, that part once you get into bleeding problems. And the same thing here happens here is you've got short half-lives, but to a large extent the clearance is reduced, and therefore to some extent it's also been uh, cleared by hemodialysis, but you do have these limited dis disadvantages overall that the survival time doesn't really make that much of a difference in the thrombin inhibitors, so you don't really get terrific value for where you are, plus it's very expensive. All of these drugs are way more expensive than you would use with any of the other uh, things itself. And the same thing happens with argotroban. Now certainly, this may be a salvageable thing if you got hit and you have no other methods with respect to using citrate anticoagulation, but this is something that you might be able to utilize in that setting. 
Prostacycline, we talked about earlier again. So this is the two to eight nanograms per kilogram infused pre-filter. Hypotension is a major issue with prostacycline and therefore it's somewhat difficult to maintain. The FOMOSTAT is a synthetic serum protease inhibitor, which has got like a prostacycline aspect, is much in use in Japan. Other than that, I don't think it's been used much where elsewhere. And the disadvantages are that you do have this, that levels of the antithrombin, antithrombin complex, and prothrombin fragment with protein C activity. So you do have some clotting episodes occurring with this. So coming to citrate, back to citrate, the issues here are basically you can increase the filter longevity considerably, maintain the circuits very well. And this titration of this is based on the ionized calcium. Now there are two ways to do it. You can titrate it to the ionized calcium or you can put a fixed relationship to the citrate and blood flow rate itself. So these are some of the citrate solutions which are out there. Now the most commonest one that you're most familiar with probably is, is ACDA because this is the solution which is used in the blood bank to keep all blood products from clotting. So ACDA, has got 2.8% citrate versus a 4% sodium citrate here, which is the, tri the trisodium citrate. And as you can see here is, there's a significant sodium load with this because each mole of citrate binds three moles of sodium. So with 140 millimoles of, of citrate per liter, that'll be about 420 millimoles of sodium out here. And these are the bag sizes. Now this solution is from the, the Baxter folks. They have created a citrate solution itself. I'm not familiar if other manufacturers have other citrate solutions, so please don't take this as the final word in terms of what's available. There may be many other citrate solutions, but these are generally the ones. Now if you use the 4% trisodium citrate versus ACDA, in general, you need about 3% of your blood flow rate to be reflected in the citrate. And that's based upon a calculation, I'll show you just a moment. So in general, if you use 3% of your blood flow rate, so this is 100 mLs per minute, so 3% would be about three cc's a minute. So that translates out in terms of how many mLs per hour you would have, so 60 times is about 175, 180 mLs. But because the citrate here is less in terms of percentages, you will obviously need more volume. So therefore, if you're going to use ACDA, you're going to use much more volume of solution, which means you have to ad adapt that to your circuit in terms of how much volume is going to come out in the ACDA. So generally, what ends up happening here is, to a large extent, that as blood is coming out, citrate is chelating the ionized calcium, and as you're using your cat, generally, most people, when we started using this many, about 30 years ago, we sat we using calcium-free dialysate, and I'll show you some changes we've done since then. And you use a post-filter ionized calcium to monitor it, and then as you go back, you can give, since you're removing the calcium citrate across in the effluent, you have to give calcium back in to the systemic circulation to compensate for what you removed. So very simple aspect in terms of how that works itself. Now the citrate which goes into the system is predominantly metabolized by the liver and the muscle to create bicarbonate. And so each mole of citrate is going to give you three moles of bicarbonate. However, the, the efficacy with which it is metabolized varies depending upon how hypotensive you are and how good your liver is working at any given point in time. So the normal blood levels of citrate are about 0.05 millimoles per liter. Bleeding time tends to occur when you get to four to six millimoles per liter, which is really hard to get to. It's very unlikely you would ever get to four to six millimoles per liter overall. And levels of 12 to 15 millimoles are required for stored blood problems. So the extracorporeal clearance, now citrate is a very small molecule, so it can come across the filter very, very well. It comes across very easily, but this is what this metabolism looks like. So you do have CO2 generation as part of this, and you do have bicarbonate and with each mole coming into this part. So for CVVH, the options for this are, you can either use a pre-dilution with a citrate-based renal replacement fluid, or a post-dilution where the citrate is simply to anticoagulate and you've got replacement fluid given overall, and you've got this, uh, this citrate and replacement fluid both pre filtered So these three opportunities overall. This, Ashita Tulwani has been using this for the CVVHD protocol where she takes a 2% trisodium citrate, so she diluted it out. So she just diluted from the 4% to 2% for CVVHD and put it at 250 mLs per hour, and as you can see here is you get the effluent, and she's giving calcium gluconate back at a rate of about 60 mLs per minute, and this is to maintain the post-filter ionized calcium of 0.25 to 0.5. I don't think she's using this system anymore, which she switched over to CVVHDF. 
Now, in the CVVHDF protocol, we had our protocol, which we have started in 1990, and in there, we're using 4% trisodium citrate. There was a blood flow rate of about 100 mLs per minute, and I'll give you some more details in a second. We use the pre-filter and the post-filter to keep the aeration chamber open, and our dialysate is going across for the dialysate itself. She's using the replacement fluid plus citrate itself. So this is the San Diego protocol, where we've got that stopcock. We've got the citrate going in right at that point itself. The pre-dilution fluid is saline at 500 mLs per hour. The post-filter fluid is 200 mLs per hour to keep that aeration chamber open. So these two add up to 700. I have one liter of dialysate going across, and I keep a negative balance of one liter, so my effluent is about 2,700 mLs. The 4% trisodium citrate is going between 142 to 20, so between about 2.5 to 3% of the flow rate, depending upon whether the patient has liver failure or not. And the post-filter anise calcium is 0.25 to 0.35, and the peripheral calcium is 1.1 to 1.32. And we maintain fluid balance by giving a post-filter replacement fluid independent of the circuit so that you can maintain the balance in that setting. Now, what Ashita does, so since uh, this was what we started off with. Now, since 2013, we were, we were left with having shortages across the United States. There was no calcium, there was no bicarbonate, there was lots of things. So we, mod we facilitated and went to calcium-containing solutions. So now I've got the same citrate protocol, but I'm using calcium-containing prismacate and calcium-containing prismasol, and I'm still finding the same aspect works. So you don't necessarily need to have calcium-free solutions to make citrate work. That's part of what we've been doing last for the last five years, and we're just in the process of looking at this. We've had over uh, 500 patients treated uh, with this over time. Now what Ashita does is she dilutes out the citrate. So she's got a 0.5% trisodium citrate which means she's using about 2,000 mLs of pre-filter solution, so she's sort of using a citrate-containing replacement fluid out here. She's running the prismacate without calcium. There's no calcium in hers, and she's as the dialysate itself, and she's replacing the calcium gluconate in the same manner here and with the same context as such. So there are these variations which occur overall, but when you look at the other alternative of how citrate can be done, that is by saying is, can there be a fixed relationship? So every time you adjust the blood flow rate, you adjust the citrate rate. Now that's what the machine manufacturers have gone towards, by saying is, can there be a fixed relationship? And that fixed relationship simply takes into form, context this formula that the blood flow rate and the citrate solution flow rates are com combined. So depending upon the citrate dose you want to give, which is to keep the blood from clotting, you simply adjust the citrate flow rates at a constant fraction. Now, there are two devices on the market that I'm aware of, and I may be, again, wrong on this, and maybe others coming up. I know that, I know that for Bibron, the Omni system has that started up coming in, but this is the Fresenius system, where you've got this fixed relationship. It's only for CBVHD. You've got the blood flow rate, and essentially, as you change the blood flow rate, you change everything else, and then the calcium is given, and they've got this separate solution which is there, which has got, this is the effluent flow, and this is the solution. This, you can see zero calcium in here. Sodium is 133. So it is a little hypotonic with respect to the, the solution itself. And what this does is essentially they have this as a circuit, and some of the studies which were done in this demonstrated that this did have a pretty good filter life itself, and they, ha they found that the, f the filter longevity was equivalent to the citrate anticoagulation protocols elsewhere. It's not available in the United States, so I don't think anyone in the U.S. has experience with it. In Europe, it is utilized, and I'm sure that some of you have much better experience with it than I do. So uh, I th what I can only tell you is from the literature, it seems to be a filter life of about 61 hours and 43, 7.7 .7 hours. In our system, my filter lives are generally about 96 hours. I can, if I change them from efficacy or oriented time points, I might change them a little earlier, but I've taken them as long as seven days on a citrate protocol. Now, you can use this also for patients with liver failure. So this is a nice uh, observational cohort study from Michael Genetis and other, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Tula, um, uh, Tulinski's group here. Uh, you can see patient with normal liver function, mild liver, severe liver failure, 
This is the citrate uh, protocol. It and filter survivals were not bad, and they did not tend to get uh, too much metabolic alkalosis, even with this fixed regimen, so they have been utilizing it. The other way is this Prismaflex, which is Gambro's exceed system. And again, I may, I, this may not be accurate for what it is currently available, but their system is the same. So they've got a calcium-free Prismacal. They've got the Prismocitrate coming in here, again, with a fixed relationship of calcium to citrate and such. And in their, their aspect, their bicarbonate is 32, their sodium is 140. They also have a calcium-free solution itself. And, but they, they suggest that you could use a calcium-containing solution. Now, if you compare the two, the Fresenius has a concentration of about 136 versus Baxter about 12. Baxter has taken the Ashita Tolwani protocol in terms of a very dilute solution to add on to it as a way to provide the citrate itself. So what about monitoring? Uh, you have to monitor for the anticoagulant effect, the filter and circuit patency, the filter efficacy, and complications. Now, most people don't do all of these. Most people just wait for just simply this, that aspect of thing. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much more, but just the detail here of these are the various monitoring aspects here. I'll spend just one aspect here in terms of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. You do want to be aware of this. This can occur and creep up on you, so this is very important to look at. When you look at calcium changes across, what you're really looking for is that you're changing the calcium across the filter. So this is what we actually measure across the filter, and you have this ultra-filtered or calcium citrate chelate. So in essence, you need to have a protocol to manage your post-filter ionized calcium, your systemic ionized calcium, similar to what we have here, if not uh, there, to change this on a sliding scale. And you have to look for these metabolic problems with citrate as you come along. Citrate gap is one of the most important ones, which is itrogenic. And it is done mostly because as you have the calcium citrate chelate not being metabolized, the total calcium, the ionized calcium looks to be low. The total calcium is getting higher because you keep giving calcium, it becomes a calcium chloride citrate. And these are the features for it in terms of increased total calcium itself. And the way to you want to get rid of this is actually look at the calcium ratio but I want to emphasize one thing. The amount of citrate you give in the circuit is minuscule in comparison to how much you give from a blood product. Every time you give a, a platelet transfusion or blood transfusion, you're giving more citrate, and that's usually the reason why you have citrate gaps occurring in this part, and certainly you have to look at this for itself. We've used it for variety of things, and just as a, f a final example, this is heparin. This is no molecular heparin. This is what citrate does. This is an electron microscopy of a fiber done many years ago over SIM, so fairly clean itself, and therefore it's fairly well recommended that you have citrate in the KDOKI guidelines. So my last part of this is with respect to uh, looking at uh, what you think of as anticoagulation, it is still the Achilles heel, and it is one of the things that requires you to be vigilant and monitoring to prevent complications. Thank you for your attention.